Un oyente de Spotify tarda de media entre 20 segundos y un minuto en encontrar la playlist que busca. Y tú te pasas en tu vida 5.000 horas buscando cosas como unos auriculares para escucharla. Y luego decimos... En IKEA sabemos que la vida es disfrutar y con orden mucho más. Por eso descubre cientos de ideas y soluciones para orden y almacenaje a un precio más bajo en tu tienda IKEA en la app o en IKEA.es. Y si lo necesitas, también hemos bajado el precio de los servicios de transporte. The Revolutionary War started as a colonial rebellion against the British on the fringes of its empire. It ended with an independent America and the idea of liberty spreading across the globe. All this happened because the rebels won the major battles. We're here to dive deep into each of them. Welcome to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast, hosted by James Early and Scott Rank. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our series on key battles in the Revolutionary War. In the first two episodes, we talked about the world of the 18th century and the series of political acts that Britain launched that agitated colonists and got to the point where they took up arms. Essentially, what we looked at was that England was bankrupt from the French and Indian Wars and thought they could generate some money from their colonists. You know, James, don't you think that's reasonable? Hey, we invested all this money in building a colony. We can get a little back. Don't you think that makes sense? It makes sense to me. It certainly made a lot of sense to the British government, <laughs> but didn't, the colonists didn't see it that way. Yeah, it either did not make sense or they acted as though it did not make sense and took up arms. And now we're going to see what happens when they do, when they're antagonized after a few years with the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, what they think are intolerable acts by the British against them, and things are going to erupt into arms. So. Let's get down to it. What is the first battle we're going to look at here in our key battles? Well, this is key battle number one. And honestly, these barely count as battles, especially Lexington. And, and it, technically, it's two separate engagements, Lexington and Concord. But we're going to treat them together as one battle because they happened within the space of a few hours of each other. And they were in two towns that weren't very far apart. So, so yeah, we'll say the battles of Lexington and Concord, key battle number one. All right. So let's just go right into it. Uh, I think we were yeah, with uh, okay. British General Gage in the previous yeah, episode. Yeah, a little background. We saw in the last episode that the British government, because of all the trouble in Boston, the, the, the natives were getting restless, so to speak, <laughs> uh, the colonists, that is. And there had been a lot of trouble. We had seen the Boston Tea Party and uh, the British government didn't take very kindly to that. And they passed a series of measures that they called the Coercive Acts to try to get the people of Massachusetts into line. The colonists did not like them, of course. They called them the intolerable acts. And one other thing that the British government did was they replaced the civilian governor, a man named Thomas Hutchinson, with a military governor and essentially put at least Boston, if not the whole colony. They didn't have a lot of control over the whole colony of Massachusetts. But the British did have pretty firm control over Boston. They had a couple thousand uh, troops there. And they put it essentially under martial law. They didn't use that term, but that, that's what we would say today. And so the man in charge, he's, he's the governor of Massachusetts, military governor. And he is also the commander in chief of all British forces in the colonies. And that is General Thomas Gage. We gave a little bit of background on him. He had been, uh, he'd been in the French and Indian War. He'd been in the British Army for a long time. He had fought alongside Washington at the Battle of the Monongahela. Make sure I say that right. It's kind of hard to say. But anyway, now, now Gage's mission is to keep the people quiet and to try to get any tax money that he could and get it sent in, but especially keep the people quiet. Now, Gage realized that the colonists were starting to walk around with rifles and they were starting to drill and militia companies were popping up everywhere. And he realized that things could get ugly really quickly. So he ordered that the provisional, or sorry, the pr provincial store, in other words, the store belonging to the province of gunpowder in Somerville, he ordered that it was, it would be seized. Somerville is about six miles from Boston. Much of it though had already been moved elsewhere. Um, the colonists lit signal fires and more militia units were called up while loyalists fled to Boston for safety. So Boston becomes the hub of loyalist activity. More and more 
Tories or loyalists moved to Boston, whereas the surrounding towns were becoming more and more uh, patriot or rebel, if you will. Depends on who you ask, who's a patriot and who's a rebel. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so the rebels or the patriots, we'll call them that. And again, I'm just using patriot as a technical term for someone who is uh, opposed to the British government and what they're doing. Now, they're not in necessarily in favor of independence at this point. Very few colonists would say at this point in 1774 that they want to be independent from Britain. They just want to have their rights respected. The independence thing is going to be uh, a little bit later. Yeah, well, I just want to say uh, that's very interesting. It's like the Civil War where the initial impetus for fighting, it changes into something else as the fighting goes on. The initial impetus for many in the Civil War was not at all emancipation. That comes later as the fighting goes on. Same thing here. Um, independence, probably there for some, but never the original goal. So that's interesting to point out. Yeah, they're just trying to uh, get their rights as they saw it re uh, re reinstated, you know, and get rid of these things like the Intolerable Acts. Now, inside Boston, there was a committee formed called the Committee of Observation, and it was under the leadership of Paul Revere. And as you can guess from the name, Committee of Observation, their job was to monitor British troop movements and to stay connected and in communication with the militia units on the outskirts of the city in places like Lexington and Concord and Cambridge and, and uh, other places in the area. Uh, so Paul Revere now steps onto the scene and Scott, I think you wanted to say something about Paul Revere specifically. Yeah. We'll come back to him later on his midnight ride. I don't, I won't say any more not to spoil anything. I learned some interesting facts about him that made his part in the story make a lot more sense that, he was a very well-known figure in New England life. He's a member of several clubs. He's a card player, a fisherman, a businessman. Any sort of local event that's happening, he's almost always at the center of it. There's hundreds, if not thousands, at his funeral when he dies. Uh, and we'll come back to that later, but I just want to mention that he's a very well-connected person in the colonies. Right, yeah. Some people forget about that. We think of him as the man that did the midnight ride and uh, some people know he was a silversmith, a very talented silversmith. He was also a very good artist. We we referred in passing to his drawing of the so-called Boston Massacre, which was a great piece of propaganda. It really helped fire people up, fire the, the people of Massachusetts up against the British government. It was not accurate, of course, but, but <laughs> hey, but that wasn't the point. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, more on Paul Revere later. But for now, he's kind of a almost like a coordinator of intelligence, wouldn't you say, Scott? Just kind of like head of head of Patriot intelligence in Boston. It's very informal, but it's going to be coming. It will become something much better later on. And it's loose, which gives the Patriots problems at this time. But, yeah, something like that. OK, so meanwhile, we've been talking a lot about Boston and Massachusetts, but especially Boston. But trouble is starting to spread to other areas. In Rhode Island and New Hampshire, two colonies pretty close by, militia units are seizing weapons and ammo. So we're starting to see more and more ammunition that I guess technically belonged to the British, but the Patriots are now commandeering it, getting hold of it, just in case there's going to be a fight. In February of 1775, Gage tried to seize more weapons and ammo at Salem, Massachusetts, the home of the famous witch trials. Um... Actually, yeah, it, it, technically it's not. But anyway, work with me, people. Come yeah, on. Close enough. Come uh, on. Salem. The, the witch trials were actually in Salem Village, which later became the, the town of Danvers. This is Salem Town. Anyway, uh, the point is, is that Gage is trying to go and basically scoop up all the weapons that he can and all the ammo and all the powder. But in this case, he, he is unsuccessful. He's not able to take the stuff from Salem. Militia units turn him back. So Gage is beginning to realize, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> this is not good. Everybody's, it seems like the whole world's going crazy around me. I'm stuck in Boston. He built defenses around Boston Neck and he asked the king for 20,000 additional troops. The king said, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you have any idea how much that costs, General Gage? No. Instead, he sends 700 Royal Marines. So, you know, Marines are great, but only 700. And I, I want to take a minute, Scott, and give our listeners one of my uh, famous, <laughs> not really famous, but 
one of my uh, mental maps. Oh, right. At the time. Yeah. So I want people to understand just how precarious the British situation in Boston is becoming. Because it's not that way today. But at the time, Boston was almost an island. Boston was on a kind of quasi-circular peninsula. And it was connected to the mainland only by a little skinny uh, strip of land, which is called Boston Neck. And the way I like to visualize it is everybody knows what a ping pong paddle looks like, right? I Scott, hope so. Play, play ping pong, Scott? Or, I've lost many, many times in college, I'm proud to say. I know ping yeah. pong well. Yeah, me too. I've slammed my uh, paddle down on the <laughs> table more than once and had the thing break off in my hand. But um, So if you, it can, if you visualize a ping pong paddle sticking up from uh, – a piece of land, the handle is Boston neck. And then the, the, the part that's the part you actually hit the ball with the paddle itself, that is Boston. And Boston is surrounded by water on, on almost all sides, except for Boston neck. Then beyond that is more land. And the, that land is where the American troops are going to end up later. We'll talk about that later, but what's going to happen over time is the uh, populations of the surrounding towns, again, Salem, Lexington, Concord, uh, Cambridge, where Harvard and MIT are today, they're becoming extremely, gradually more uh, radicalized and anti-British. And it, what's going to happen is Gage is not going to be able to get out of there. But anyway, um, so here's Gage. He's got a couple thousand guys and now 27,000 Royal Marines. And he's just trying to keep the situation from completely blowing up in his face. Here's something I'm curious about. Now, you mentioned these troop numbers. He doesn't get his request fulfilled, although many, many British troops come later when this Cold War turns hot. But mm -hmm. something I don't want to take for granted is how long does it take troops to come from England? And are they coming from England? And the reason I'm curious is we usually just gloss over this, but... When we looked at the Civil War, one of the biggest challenges was troop movement, where when you don't have railroad tracks or good roads, it really takes a long time to move troops. This is moving troops against an enemy on the same landmass. But for the Revolutionary War, we're talking about sending thousands of troops on sail ship, not even steamship, where it takes weeks and there could be inclement mm -hmm. weather to slow things down. So how long does it take? Are they coming from England? Are they coming from the Caribbean, elsewhere? To get technical, I, I'm thinking about this because in American history fanatics, we have a man who lives in Canada, uh, but he's from Scotland originally. And every time somebody uses the word England, uh, he he <laughs> gets on, he corrects them, he jumps on their case. So he says there is no nation of England today. Okay, so technically since 1707, uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. After 1707, those four nations were the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. So That's right. I, yeah. I knew it was in the 1700s. I was being precise, but it turns out I was just being precisely wrong. So I'm thinking about, thinking about my buddy, Stephen, if you're listening, I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> and any of our other British listeners, we're not trying to uh, insult the nation by just calling it England. <laughs> but it's interesting that uh, – so. To, to answer your question with that correction thrown in, most of the troops are coming from Great Britain at this time, or the United Kingdom, to be completely correct. It's interesting, Scott, that the majority of them, or at least a big minority, are actually Irish and Scottish, so they're not really English. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that just presents an interesting dynamic. But most of them are loyal to the crown. The, the Irish aren't really happy about being uh, under the domination of Great Britain at this time, as they never were. But the thing about being in the army, and we're going to do a whole uh, sidetrack episode on what it was like to be a British soldier as well as a continental soldier. We'll do that next time. But for now, suffice it to say that being in the British army was a way to get a steady job. It was a way to get three meals a day. Uh, and you know, Discipline was brutal. But as long as you kept your nose clean and didn't get in trouble and didn't try to run away, it, was a, it wasn't a bad life. Well, as long as you didn't get shot either, that's always a plus. Or get disease. <laughs> We're going to see that a lot of soldiers are going to die of disease. Oh, yeah. But Mr. Yes. Malaria is going to rear his ugly head. Yeah, worse than the Civil War even um, in terms of the percentage of that died of disease. But anyway, so yes, most of them are coming from 
the United Kingdom. Uh, you have a few British regular troops stationed in Canada, but they're going to stay in Canada for the most part. They're they're not going to be moved too much because there's always the threat of an American invasion of Canada. There, there really just aren't that many people in Canada at this point. And so the Americans are, they're always going to have that in their mind to go up and seize Canada and maybe add it to the United States. And we're going to see later, they're going to, they're going to give it the old college try. <laughs> A little bit of Northern right. manifest destiny. Um, so yeah, exactly. They're going to, they're going to try it again in 1812, but maybe we'll talk about that. That's another lecture series or, yeah. So how do uh, the Continental Congress plays into all this? Uh, so what comes of all that and what causes this first meeting? OK, so the American colonies and it's not just Massachusetts that's beginning to rebel. We've seen some action in in uh, New Hampshire and Rhode Island. Virginia is really getting upset with the mother country at this point, as well as some of the other colonies. And the Colonial leaders in the various colonies, we can't call them states yet, but the colonies, they realized they need to work together. We had seen the uh, Stamp Act Congress in 1765, but it really wasn't that well attended. They need some kind of central body to, to give some overall leadership to the colonies. This will be the closest thing to a central or federal government that we're going to have for a while. So it's called the Continental Congress. Virginia and Massachusetts, which were the two most populous colonies and the two most rebellious, I guess, or at least the most influential rebellious colonies, they send out a call for a Continental Congress to meet in Philadelphia, and 12 of the 13 colonies sent representatives. All right, uh, anybody want to guess? Who wants to guess which one did not send a representative? Anybody know? Uh, uh. I think our... Uh, do you know, Scott? <laughs> uh, do, I think I see a hand back there. Do you see it, James? Yes, I do. Uh, I think it's, uh, I'll give you a hint. There was a Ray Charles song about this this state or this land. Oh, a little geography it's, quiz. Yeah, there, okay, it's Georgia. Oh, Georgia. Man, I'll tell you what. Georgia had a lot of loyalists at this time. They are eventually going to get on board with the cause, but not quite yet. Okay, so the Congress meets and they endorsed the Suffolk Resolves. And I don't know that we mentioned the Suffolk Resolves. I, I can't remember if we did. Gosh, it's been a week. So much has happened. But, but the Suffolk Resolves were uh, a statement in Suffolk County, Massachusetts, made by several of the Massachusetts Patriot leaders. And they declared uh, the rights of the colonies against the British uh, government, especially regarding taxation. The Congress declared that Britain had no right to tax the colonies. And they agreed to meet again in May 1775 to reassess the situation. One other very important thing they did was they agreed to boycott British goods beginning in 1774, December of 1774. And this boycott was very effective. Imports from Britain dropped 97%, 97% in one year. That's like almost completely gone. And that really hurt the British economy. This wasn't the first attempt to boycott but it was the most effective one. Um, so in response to what's going on in Massachusetts, General Gage dissolved the Massachusetts legislature and they just went a little bit west and reconvened. They just ignored him and they said, oh, we're going to meet anyway, just not in, not in Boston. And the general didn't have a lot of authority outside of Boston, so they just continued their, their uh, actions and they called themselves the Provincial Congress. Gage began to hear rumors that the colonists were stockpiling weapons and gunpowder at the town of Concord. So, uh, and this is a big cache, cache or whatever you want to call it, a big, a big supply. He, so Gage wants to get hold of this stuff, this gunpowder, these weapons. So he begins planning a mission to seize the weapons and the gunpowder. And he also heard that two of the key rebel leaders, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, we're staying in the town of Lexington, which was on the road to Concord. So Gage decides, well, I got to have the supplies. I've got to have the gunpowder, the weapons, and maybe I can bag these other two, these leaders too. And, and that'll hopefully put an end to this rebellion or at least damage it severely. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. One other thing, too, there's a lot of really interesting things that come out with the Suffolk Resolves. 
where trade from Great Britain, and that includes Ireland and the West Indies, are boycotted. And this seems to be very effective. Here's my question. The reverse thing, again, we're comparing to the Civil War, where the Confederacy sees the beginning of the end when it's cut off. There's a shipping blockade. Also, after the siege of Vicksburg, they really don't have much access west of the Mississippi. And this is what cripples the Confederacy. But it seems like the colonists bring this upon themselves, and it seems to do really well for themselves. So what's the difference here? Are they just better at living off the land because they're in a pre-industrial economy compared to the Confederacy? Or is there something else you think? Well, I don't think so. We, we, there's a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, the main crops that were exported to Britain were very different. And at the time of the Civil War, it was cotton. So in 1861, the Confederacy boycotted, or actually not boycotted, but they declared a ban on exports of cotton to the Confederacy. Um, and they thought, well, the Britain needs our cotton so badly that this will hurt their economy so much, they'll just beg us to lift the, uh, the ban on exports and maybe they'll come help us too. Um, in this case, it's tobacco. So different, different, uh, and tobacco is such a big cash crop. This it's a different crop situation. But another thing that's even more important is that by the mid 18 hundreds, like by 1850s, 1860s, the British empire had expanded so much that they had plenty of other places where they could go and plenty of other colonies where they could go and grow things. Um, so, uh, for example, when the South cut off the cotton, well, the British said, okay, fine, we'll just go grow cotton in India. We'll grow cotton in Egypt, which the, the wasn't a possibility in 17, in the 1770s. I don't, I'm not an expert on the agriculture, but I don't think you can grow tobacco in Egypt and in India. And, and I don't even, I don't think the British control over those areas was quite as complete as it was uh, later. In other words, the British couldn't just turn and say, well, we'll plant our tobacco in Egypt or in India. Um, they didn't have as much control over those lands. And again, it's a completely different crop, different type of soil. So, they just they weren't able to replace that source of tobacco like they were in in the 1770s like they were able to replace the cotton market in the 1860s does that make sense yeah thanks for explaining that because there's lots of little things like this that i think when i was first learning these things in public school i let slide but now i'm curious about them okay so britain is being pushed into a corner, forced to show their hand. So Gage is ready to do that. What happens next? All right. So he wants, as I mentioned, he wanted to capture the uh, supplies, the gunpowder and the weapons and the ammo that was in Concord that the, the, he thought the colonial leaders were uh, storing up, hiding. So he puts together a small force. He puts a man named Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith and also Major John Pitcairn. Pitcairn is a Marine, raw, uh, <laughs> Semper Fi, in charge of a force of 800 light infantry and grenadiers. Uh, light infantry, I should say, is different from regular infantry in that it just it doesn't carry as much stuff. The average British soldier carried a lot of gear, a lot of equipment. They were really weighed down. Light infantry traveled lighter, and they were able to move faster. They were people who were more physically fit. Uh, of course, back then, you and I have discussed this on another podcast, but they didn't have boot camp. You know, they, they didn't yeah. have guys running obstacle courses and doing five mile runs and doing the uh, yeah, jumping over walls and doing the pull, what, what the monkey bars. <laughs> they didn't have any of that. They they didn't train physically a whole lot. They instead they drilled and they they just made sure that they could fire their weapons, which is very complicated. But anyway. Um, these light infantry guys, these were quick, fast, light-footed guys. And then you had grenadiers. Grenadiers were another special type of unit that their original job was to carry grenades, primitive grenades, of course, not like modern-day grenades, but the equivalent of grenades. But eventually they just kind of morphed into infantry who were very tough, you know, just kind of like big, strong, strapping guys. So almost like heavy infantry in a way. So you've got uh, 
and, and normally these these types of troops were a part of each regular regiment. So, and again, I, I don't want to steal my own thunder. We'll talk, we'll go over this more systematically in the next uh, discussion that we have. But for now, let's just say if you had a regular regiment, you would have a light infantry company within that regiment and a grenadier company within every regiment. But what Gage did is he stripped those off from different regiments and made it a force of all light infantry and grenadiers. Very interesting. So um, the thing that was interesting about that is that they had not fought together. Okay. So these 800 were not used to working together. They hadn't really trained together, at least not. I mean, the ones within the individual companies, of course, had, but uh, the, the, between companies, there had been no previous collaboration. And Smith and Pitcairn had not commanded these men before. So they hadn't had time to get to know each other yet. And this is going to lead to a lot of confusion later when fighting breaks out. All right. On April 18th, a group of 20 men galloped out to secure road crossings and to prevent Patriot Express riders from warning the militias at Lexington and Concord. But, of course, they're not completely successful. Smith and Pitcairn, they didn't want to come through Boston Neck because it was being guarded. It was just too dangerous. They didn't know where Patriots might be. They might be hiding in the hills or somewhere, and they might shoot at them. So instead, they secretly, they thought secretly, got in boats, and they ferried across the Charles River. And the Charles River is just to the west of Boston. Remember, Boston's the big ping-pong paddle, <laughs> the great ping-pong <laughs> paddle. And um, they go across the water, and they land in Cambridge which is uh, on the mainland. Although some sources say they landed on the Charlestown Peninsula, which is to the north. But anyway, regardless of that, they got onto the mainland and they decided to march the rest of the way. Patriot spies were all over the place. They warned the militias in the surrounding towns. The militiamen were called Minutemen, by the way. Everybody, everybody's probably heard of Minutemen because they had to be ready on a minute's notice. They had to be uh, just ready to jump up, grab their hat, grab their gun and go. Now, Paul Revere, who we talked about earlier, he was monitoring the activities of the British Army, and he had made arrangements for a signal to be placed in the Old North Church. And this is the famous one if by land and two if by sea incident. In other words, uh, I, I forget the guy's name that he had do this, but it doesn't really matter. So if the British went by land through Boston Neck and around to the west, or first north and then west, there was going to be one lantern hung way up high in the Old North Church where everybody could see it. If they went across the water, it was going to be two lanterns. And, of course, they went across the water, so two lanterns were hung. So that way, Revere and the other spies knew which route the troops were taking and roughly how long it would take them to get there. In Concord, the residents began moving the military supplies out of town. And on April 19th, famously, two express riders— Paul Revere and a man named William Dawes. You know, it's it's sad, uh, Scott, because Dawes never gets any credit. I bet nobody's ever heard of William Dawes. They have, I'll mention why no one knows about him a little later. But yes, there okay. were two of them, but no one knows about him, just Paul Revere. Yeah, Revere gets all the, all the fame and the glory. But anyway, it's because of that poem, doggone it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Revere and Dawes, they gallop out of Boston. They head to Lexington and Concord to warn the militias there. At Lexington, they were joined by a third rider, Samuel Prescott, or Prescott. And Prescott, by the way, just fun fact on the side, Prescott is an ancestor of President George H.W. Bush. How about that? So he, uh, Prescott is, is one of the names in Bush's family lines. I thought that was interesting when I learned that. Anyway, Revere and Dawes reach Lexington. They roused Adams and Hancock. They said, "You got to get out of here. Here, the you know the British regular troops are coming." And I don't. I seriously doubt, by the way, that Revere said the British are coming. The British are coming. He probably said the regulars are coming or the redcoats are coming. But who knows? Uh, I mean, technically, these guys are British too, right? Yeah, they're all <laughs> anyway, subjects. I mean, they see themselves as different, but they still see themselves as British subjects. So. I mean, I was raised, I think, in elementary school. They told me that he said, the British are coming, the British are coming. But that's doubtful. All that's right, anyway, so they they reach Lexington. They get Adams and Hancock moving. And they Adams and Hancock flee into the, into the woods. 
And the Lexington militia comes, calls up and gets ready to meet these coming British soldiers. Now, they rode on to Concord, the second town, and between Lexington and Concord, Revere was caught. Dawes turned back, but Prescott escaped, and he made it to Concord. So Revere, uh, contrary to what some people may think, Revere didn't make it all the way on the ride. Uh, Samuel Prescott finished the job. Revere was captured and eventually was released, but, but he wasn't able to complete the ride. But anyway, the point is, is that the message did get to Concord thanks to Samuel Prescott. And as the regulars marched, the regulars meaning the redcoats, the British regular troops, warning shots and bells were heard all along the way. Militiamen turned out everywhere. So these Minutemen, they did their job. They got out on a moment's notice. Can you imagine, Scott, being one of those British soldiers here? You know, you, you get on the boat, you go across the Charles River, you reassemble on the mainland and you start marching toward Lexington and all of a sudden you start hearing shots going off in the woods and off in the distance you hear bells ringing and you, you they must have been thinking oh crap this is not <laughs> this is supposed to be secret <laughs> I, we're not our our coming was not supposed to be heralded by the ringing of bells and the firing of muskets but that's exactly what happened so by the time they get to Lexington uh, nobody's going to be surprised yeah, so our little reconnaissance team can work. One interesting thing about Paul Revere and William Dawes is if it were just William Dawes trying to deliver the message, it very well could have happened that the Minutemen wouldn't have been roused to action. And you were mentioning, James, that we all know Paul Revere, but no one knows William Dawes. Part of the reason is that he's mentioned in almost no historical sources at all, but uh, Paul Revere is. And why is that? Uh, I learned about this not from a history book, but pop psychology, Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point, where he gets into network theory. And this is something that historians use where it's been found. Usually there are types of people called connectors, meaning that your average person might only have maybe a few dozen or a few hundred relations. And the, it averages out to about a 200 per person. But then there are always people on the barbell curve at the extreme end who might know thousands of people and be the central node. And if you want to get a message out to a community, talk to that person because he knows so many people that he will trigger it. Well, Paul Revere was that. I mentioned earlier he's actively engaged in colonial life. He knew hundreds of people. And it meant that when he rode into a town, he knew exactly what house to go to, who had influence. If you ride by a certain house and shout that, the um not the british what's the term you use james uh the regulars regulars thank you the regulars are coming he would know this man is the local dignitary the tanner that everyone knows whatever and then the word would get around to the town and the village william dawes was not well connected i think i would be much more of a dawes than a paul revere so he would just knock on a door at random and it might be some sleepy farmer and he thinks well, i don't know you and um shut the door so Dawes rode 17 miles, and some historians even wondered if he didn't speak to a single person on the way, because he's rarely in the records, but that's because he didn't have the social gravity or the social currency that Paul Revere did. So that's why almost no one remembers him that night. I don't know if James were trying to do revisionist history and recover William Dawes or not, or say, be a go-getter if you want to get in the historical record, but there you go. That's the story. Yeah, there's also the uh, famous poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Paul Revere's Ride, which some of us that are older probably read that in grade school or something. And it starts out, listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year and so on and so on. And uh, it's so it immortalizes Paul Revere, and, and there's no mention of Dawes at all. I guess it wouldn't rhyme very well, right, Scott? Revere Listen and Dawes. They yeah. were like eagles Listen. with sharp claws. Yes. Yeah, no, it's like I, I just can't fit that into the poem. It doesn't fit the rhyming scheme and the meter. So uh, sorry, Dawes. You're <laughs> out of here. All right, let's move on, shall we? Yes. So let's march along with the British. Picture yourself as one of these British soldiers. You, you think – you're, you're, well, I mean, some of them didn't even really know what they were doing, where they were going, but you're going through the dark and then you start hearing all these shots fired off and you hear people shouting and you hear church bells going off and you realize, hmm, maybe this isn't going to be quite as easy as we thought it would. 
So they marched toward Lexington. They reached the outskirts of the town around 4.30 a.m. So they'd been marching through the night several hours. You know these British troops are very sleepy. They're they're yawning, and if it's like me, man, I, I, I would be just about to fall asleep right there on the spot. Uh, an advanced unit of the British force arrived at the town's common area, which is now called Lexington Green. And you can actually go there and see that very green today. I was there back in 2011. It was really neat. And in Lexington Green, the British encountered about 60 to 70 armed militiamen. Nobody really knows exactly how many there were. There had been more, but some of them had gone home. Um, and here are these militiamen, these Americans... So remember, if you're a British soldier, you're part of the best army in the world, or at least one of the best armies in the world. And these are a bunch of farmers with guns. That's what I call militia, farmers <laughs> with guns. Most They're not all 100% farmers, but most of them would have been. But of course, they knew how to shoot. They weren't bad shots. Just because we call them farmers with guns, that doesn't mean they were incompetent. They certainly didn't have the discipline that the British soldiers had. So there they are, 60 or 70, give or take a few, were standing there waiting on them. And the militia were led by Captain John Parker. And I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to take an excursus here, Scott. I'm going to take a side note. So let's push pause on the military narrative. All and right. I want to talk about quotations. You know, you read enough books and you'll see these famous quotations that a lot of us already know. Things like don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. And, and Scott, you've done a lot of historical research I've done quite a bit myself, and, and so you know this, Scott, that you'll, you'll read one book and it'll say, oh, there's no way that person actually said that. that that's just got to be apocryphal or it's got to be a, a, a made-up story. That, they wouldn't have said that. And then you'll read another scholar who'll say, oh, yeah, they definitely said it. <laughs> and then you'll read a third scholar who'll say, well, they might have said it. We really don't know. So, so I'm going to err on the side of credulity. I'm going to I'm going to say that these guys said these things and, and maybe they didn't. Maybe I'll, I don't know, Scott, maybe I'll use the phrase he is said to have shouted. Well, okay. You know, we've, we've made that caveat emptor or caveat, whatever Latin is for listener. I don't know. I, oh. I think we could just say without qualification, most of the, the background would be behind us, but you are right. Some of them just seem too perfect. Yeah. You know, and some of them... It was you first see the quote in a source written a hundred years later or something, but but you know what, Scott? I like the quotes, and I they should have been said if they were do it. They should have said it. Let's do it. We're gonna lay out most of these famous quotes for you folks, and don't send us an angry email or comment saying, "Well, they didn't really say that." You gotta know better than that. You guys call yourselves scholars. We, we realize that there is a degree of skepticism with a lot of these quotes. But we like them, and yeah. so we're going to throw them out anyway. They make the story a lot more colorful and fun. Hey, everyone. Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. So let's go back. So, again, the, the militia the, – I'm not the militia. I'm sorry, the British Army. It's not the full army, of course. It's, it's a group of about seven, 800 people. They are marching toward Lexington. They encounter 60 to 70 armed militiamen. They have them outnumbered 10 to 1. And the militia's leader, Captain John Parker, supposedly shouted to his men, stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they want to have a war, let it begin here. Major Pitcairn, in turn, he, he, he supposedly said, throw down your arms, you rebels. Disperse. Damn you, disperse. And the, the Minutemen, some of them thought that was a pretty good idea. <laughs> you know, um Guys, there's 10 of them for every one of us, <laughs> and they're professionals. So some of the Minutemen actually did turn to leave, but they kept their arms. And again, Pitt Cairns supposedly shouted, damn you, why don't you lay down your arms? Another officer shouted, damn them, we will have them. So a lot of uh, <laughs> damning and condemning. But finally, the war of words turns into a shooting match. One of the British soldiers fired without orders. Or he had an accidental discharge. It's kind of like the Boston Massacre. We don't really know what happened, why they fired, or, or whether it was intentional or not. But we know that th this was not ordered. The British commander, uh, uh, Smith, he didn't, or Pitcairn, neither one of them ordered that the, the British troops fire upon the, the Minutemen. But somebody did, and pretty soon all the British opened fire, and they killed eight, and they wounded ten. 
The remaining rebels scattered. No British were killed and only one was wounded. Colonel Smith then arrived, reformed the troops and marched them to Concord. And as they marched again, they heard alarm guns going off to summon more militiamen. Well, we don't know about the quotes of some of these people, but we do know a John Adams one. I think you have on Lexington. If I'm... Yeah. So before I give you the Adams quote and there's Adams said a lot of things and he wrote a lot of things. Adams has one of the most voluminous correspondences ever. Uh, thank, thank goodness. And they didn't burn them like some of the people did like that. You know, George Washington, Martha Washington burned almost all of her letters back and forth with George, which historians are not happy yeah. about today. <laughs> but anyway, um, so before I talk, uh, give the John Adams quote, I just want to sum up by saying this is the battle of Lexington. And again, it's not much of a battle. It's just 800 versus perhaps 70. So that's a very, very small battle, even by Revolutionary War standards. It's really just more of a, a skirmish, Scott, or a firefight. I don't know. It's just a one exchange of fire. Eight are killed, 10, is, 10 are wounded, and that's it. But it's important symbolically because this is the first time uh, – you had a semi a, a sizable or major exchange of fire between British and colonial uh, military units. And this makes it very, very difficult for there to be peace, for it to be any reconciliation. It's not impossible at this point. Again, it's a minor occasion, but still, this woke up the British and it woke up the world in a way that it's often called the shot heard around the world. It's considered the first battle of the American Revolution. Even though it's very, very small. And here's what John Adams said. He said, the Battle of Lexington on the 19th of April changed the instruments of warfare from the pen to the sword. So that's very, uh, very concise and pithy way of putting it, I thought. Well, uh, one, uh, just a little fact before we get on to the March at Concord. I read somewhere that there were still people hoping that warfare wouldn't break out. And there were even those in Great Britain who raised money for the widows of Americans killed in Lexington and Concord. There you go. For take take that oh, yeah. for what it will. There was a lot of uh, there was a significant amount of pro-American or pro-colonial sentiment in uh Great Britain. Obviously it's a minority, but it is significant. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving on to Concord, the British force just as, as we've seen they they fire on the Americans or the Patriots or the Minutemen, whatever you want to call them. There's a lot of ways to refer to them and basically sweep them aside. And they continue on to the next town, which is Concord. They reach Concord by daybreak. Okay, so it's about seven or eight o'clock in the morning. And the militia there realize they're outnumbered. So they they retreat northward. There was a there was a, a river or creek, really, and there was a bridge. There's several bridges, but this one particular bridge called the North Bridge, which is going to have uh, a major part in the, in the drama, if you will, they go across the North bridge to higher ground and they wait. Colonel Smith sends seven companies of light infantry through the town and then across the bridge. If you think the town is, imagine a computer screen or as a map, the town is kind of at the bottom middle of the screen. And then the, the river or the Creek is right above it. And then the bridge is there. So, so the British sweep through the town. They go across the bridge, uh, which spans the Concord River, and they pro they form a protective line to keep the uh, militia people or the Minutemen back. And while they're doing this, the Grenadiers search the local houses for the military supplies. Remember, the whole point of going to Concord was to find the gunpowder and the weapons and the ammo that the Americans were supposedly storing there. All they found were three wooden cannon, okay, wooden cannon. <laughs> so this is not exactly a state-of-the-art uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, arsenal here. So they burned the cannon, and they also burned the town's Liberty Pole. Liberty Pole was just a pole that the, uh, the colonists put up kind of to as a symbol of their liberty and their freedom, their rights, which the British were trampling upon, they felt. Uh, another two companies of regulars searched a farmhouse west of town, but they found nothing. So they just can't find all this ammo that was supposed to be there. Meanwhile, several companies of militiamen, a, a total of about 500 men, gathered on Punkatasset Hill. And again, this is north of where the British are. 
They're commanded by a man named Colonel James Barrett. The British just didn't pay a lot of attention to them. Again, they're searching. They're, they're looking for these supplies, this military gear. The militiamen marched to a ridge 300 feet west of the North Bridge, and they deployed them in battle formation. So the militias decide they're going to go on the offensive now. They've been kind of watching and waiting. One of the lieutenants of the militiamen, a man named Joseph Hosmer, he saw the smoke from the burning artillery pieces, and he thought it was coming from burning buildings in the town. So he sees this smoke, and he thinks, uh-oh, they're burning our town down. And he said, supposedly, <laughs> should I throw on that disclaimer every time, Scott? No. If we forget, yeah, if we forget, listener, then just remember, we're not always saying that these these are the gospel truth, these quotes. But anyway, he said, so I often heard it said that the British have boasted that they could march through our country, laying waste to our hamlets and villages, and we would not oppose them. And I begin to think it is true. Will you let them burn the town down? And you could just imagine if this was a and movie. And they shouted, no! 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 Never! Uh, so uh, maybe they did that, maybe they didn't. But one thing we do know is they, they got in motion finally. Hosmer rallied the troops and he marched them down to the North Bridge. And when they were 50 yards away, they opened fire and they wounded more than a dozen British soldiers. So the British realized, okay, these guys are a little bit more determined than the ones in Lexington. They're not going to run away. Plus, there's a lot more of them. The British did return fire and two militiamen were killed and one wounded. And this time the British, it's their turn to bro- break and run. They, they skedaddled. They got out of there. Smith was able to rally the troops, and he had them retreat to Concord, back to the town, away from the bridge. He knew they were outnumbered, and then he finally says, you know what, let's just go all the way back to Boston. Uh, Let's just go back home. We failed in our mission. Let's get out of here while the getting is good. So there you go. That is the Battle of Concord. And I always tell my students, so the Battle of Lexington was a British victory victory such that it was a battle and the battle of Concord is an American victory. And this shows the British, we'll talk more about consequences and aftermath later, but the British realize these, okay, these guys may be amateurs, but they know how to fight. They're determined. They're not just going to run away every single time we show up just because we have red uniforms on. Yeah. And I think that, uh, the retreat back beyond the battle proper maybe has more implications than the actual battle itself, which you mentioned Lexington was essentially a misfire that turned into a few more fires. Um, yeah, Concord, yeah it was, wasn't much of Concord anything. was a, a minor ambush, uh, and another minor exchange of fire, but then the retreat is, uh, I think gives us a little bit of a taste of what's to come. So, so what happens on the retreat? Yeah, the retreat, as you said, is really going to drive home the point that the British are not invincible. The British Army, especially the officers, had this really arrogant, prideful notion that they could whip any farmer with a gun, any colonial militia. They thought of the the colonists as a bunch of country bumpkins, a bunch of guys that you know, they just were amateurs and we're professionals. It, it's similar, Scott, to what we when we talked about the Civil War at the very beginning. The Southerners especially thought, you know, one one rebel can whip ten Yankees. Remember that, mm-hmm. Scott? They thought we grew up hunting and shooting and all that, and uh, these Yankees are a bunch of wimps. That turned out to not be the case. So, in the same vein, it turned out the British are going to learn a lesson here in. Uh, Just how effective the Americans can be as a fighting force. Are they, I mean, yes, they're disorganized. Yes, they're amateurs, but still they can, they can hurt you. So the British start marching back to Boston. And remember, it's not that far. I mean, today you can drive. I think I drove from Boston to Concord in about half an hour. So I think it's 13, 14 miles. I don't have the number in front of me, but it's 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 a good way to march, especially uh, if you're exhausted. You've been marching literally all night, and now you're having to march all day. And then guess what happens? The militiamen harass and ambush the British column. They don't just let them go back. No, no, no. They're going to make them pay. They fired from behind trees. They fired from behind rocks. They fired from buildings. They fired from fences. So they're not playing by the rules, are they, Scott? <laughs> no, it's getting ugly. It's guerrilla warfare. Yeah, exactly. And and this is one of the times that the, the Americans are famous for not fighting in the traditional battle style, continental battle style. They they don't 
they don't line up and meet the British. Sometimes they do surprise them on the road, but for the most part, it is guerrilla warfare. The British, as we've seen, were exhausted. They were disorganized. They're running out of ammo, and they did not take prisoners. They were getting mad. They were really, really getting ticked off, and so they started killing militiamen they found, including the wounded. Some of them looted houses. They killed civilians. They bayoneted people. Uh, so this is not a way to win friends and influence people, right, Scott? Like, to quote from Carnegie, uh, Dale Carnegie, you know, there, there's there's going to be even less chance of a reconciliation after the, the way the British behave on this march back. Yeah. And again, you can kind of understand why they did this, because the Americans were also not being not playing by the rules. And there were incidences of American atrocities as well. Did you want to talk about that? a little? Well, more? yeah, it, it's interesting and it's very ugly on the way back in some ways from both sides. In the course of the Revolutionary War, some have commented on Indian-style tactics of ambush and using inferior numbers. To compensate for that, you do lightning strikes through terrain that you know well, but your enemy doesn't know. And so for the British, when they can't get off very many shots or it takes time to reload and they have a very limited time to strike an enemy— Uh, For the British flankers, when they were caught by individuals or small groups when they're being harassed on the way back, they'd fire on the column from the rear, and some of them would do quick bayonet charges because that was the fastest and simplest way to go at these people that were harassing you before the militiamen could reload. So, uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's getting pretty ugly on both sides getting back there. Exactly. General Gage realizes that there's trouble. He learns about the, the opposition that the British Army, is the, the force, is facing, how they've already lost quite a few soldiers. So he sends a force of about 1,000 men, which is more than double what the British had originally sent. And these are under Brigadier General Lord Percy to rescue the retreating redcoats and to escort them to Boston. And they had two cannon with them. Okay, so now no more Mr. Nice Guy. Now they're not messing around. Not that they were nice before, but but – Gage basically decides, all right, enough is enough. I'm going to send it cannon. I'm going to make it – take it up a notch, so to speak. I'm bringing in the heavy guns. And that's really what saved the British force. Had Gage not done this, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the entire British force would have either been killed, wounded, or captured. So anyway, with the escort of these extra thousand men, the British do make it back. The British soldiers, they make it back to the Charlestown Peninsula around 7 p.m., just north of Boston, and then eventually they make it into Boston. So to sum up, all together on this campaign, and again, this all happened over the over the course of one day. Okay, remember they left. It's like a 24-hour campaign. They left the night before, and the battles took place in the early morning, and then they got back in the evening. But all together, 73 British soldiers were killed, 174 were wounded and 53 were missing, adding up to about 300 total casualties. And that is 20% of the original force, give or take. So that that's a significant amount. Think about that. For every five that left Boston to go, quote unquote, punish the rebels and, and grab the military goods and stuff, of every four that left, of every five that left, Four came back. Hmm. Only four came back. So that's a twenty percent. That's a pretty good uh, casualty rate, especially when it was inflicted by people that the British considered amateurs and incompetents. The American militia lost fifty dead and thirty nine wounded, five missing. So that's ninety four total casualties. So again, that's three hundred on the British side and less than a hundred on the American side. So the Americans. Really, or, or again, the Minutemen, Patriots, whatever you want to call them, we'll use the terms interchangeably. They really punished the British for doing this. A three to one ratio of casualties. Right. And there's something else is interesting here, too. Troops here aren't the troops that you see at the end of the Revolutionary War. It's sort of like in World War II, the beginning of the war, the American military is paltry compared to the juggernaut that rolls yeah. on the beaches of Normandy and D Day. These troops, they're not Francis Mary and the Swamp Fox on whom Mel Gibson's character is loosely based in The Patriot, where he and his sons are sniping an entire platoon of British soldiers. They're like ghosts throwing their hatchets yeah. and shooting from, you know, 40 meters away, whatever. No, the American troops were terrible shots. The unit cohesion was poor. They were brave, no question, 
company commanders couldn't really exercise much control. Usually a militia company would just close in on the tail of a British column. They'd follow the British rear for a while, then they'd retire from the battle. So there were lots of opportunities to cut off the British troops from Boston entirely, and the majority reached the city safely. So it's almost it's amazing that the British were actually able to not be annihilated. They were relieved, so that made the difference. The Minutemen had a major artillery advantage, but little of it was used on the British column. The majority of the Minutemen arms were muskets, and the kill-to-shot ratio was just terrible. I think I read somewhere that like 75,000 rounds were fired at the British, but they only killed or wounded, like you said, a total of about 300 casualties. Whatever this ratio is, it's like after a one per every few hundred shots actually hits its target. So this isn't the stuff of the Swamp Fox and the sure shot American riflemen that you hear of accounts later on in the war. Yeah, these uh, more on this later, but just as a teaser for now, the the Americans at this point were almost entirely using unrifled muskets, just smoothbore, and they had a very limited range. They were highly inaccurate. You couldn't hit anything more than about maybe – I don't know, 60 yards, 80 yards. Not You couldn't even shoot a whole football field away. <laughs> Not that they had <laughs> football fields back then. <laughs> but have. anyway, uh, there will be rifles used later on in the revolution, and they're going to be very accurate and, and deadly. But we'll talk about that more later. So let's talk about the aftermath of this these battles. Here are uh, some quotes and some just other interesting facts. Lord Percy, he was the, the general who brought the 1,000 troops that escorted the British back and basically saved them. Lord Percy wrote this, For my part, I have never believed, I confess, that they would have attacked the king's troops or have had the perseverance I found in them yesterday. Whoever looks on them as an irregular mob will find himself very much mistaken. So in other words, putting it in modern language, uh, Percy is saying, these guys are much better than we thought they were. Do not... uh, fail to take them seriously. They, they are not bad soldiers. So word of the fight spreads rapidly. Paul Revere and other express writers, there were lots of writers. Again, Paul Revere was just the most famous one. They carried the news all over the colonies. And this has a great effect on American morale. Hmm. A lot of people want to get in on the fight. And about 15,000 militiamen from various colonies, various towns, they come to the Boston area and they deploy around the city. So they're essentially surrounding the city, and Gage and the British Army is going to be trapped on that ping pong, <laughs> on that ping pong paddle, uh, just connected to the land by uh, just that little handle, the Boston Neck. General Gage and the British troops in Boston are essentially under siege, and remember, Boston is very low lying, and the surrounding area on the mainland has a lot of high ground. Uh, we'll see more about that later. On May 26th, Gage received reinforcements, and among these reinforcements were three major generals. I bet he thought, oh, great. <laughs> I just wanted, wanted more guys to, to try to uh, cause me trouble and to give orders and, and suggest, oh, you shouldn't do it that way. Do it this way. Uh, but these guys are all going to have a big future, so let's go ahead and get their names out there. The three generals who arrive are William Howe, John Burgoyne, and Henry Clinton. And we will have a lot to say about all three of these gentlemen. And they all thought they were much better than General Gage. They would have loved to have replaced him. Gage had only 6,000 soldiers in Boston to hold off the 15,000 American militiamen around the city. So, outnumbered by more than two to one, things are not looking good for the British. The British were now faced with the problem of, and this is a quote from a book called The Glorious Cause by Robert Middlecoff, a very good book, overall uh, book on the revolution. The problem is, quote, how to subdue not just another army, but a population in rebellion. So the British are not just lining up against another army, like the French army, for example. They're, it's the entire populace just about that is opposed to them, thousands of people. And again, the battles become known as the shot heard round the world. So this is the opening salvo in what's going to become a much broader, a much bigger, and a much bloodier war, which is going to last for eight years. Yeah, this is something that in terms of numbers, it's very small. It's 
in many ways has it has important symbolic value. It's like the Doolittle raid in World War II, the first strike against Japan after Pearl Harbor. In in terms of overall strategy, had almost minimal, if non-existent, effect on the war, but it was p- almost purely psychological. This has a lot of that too. We we can't see a couple of things emerge as as you highlighted, James. The really big thing is that the British understand that they have to take the colonists seriously, that this is a serious matter we have to put down. On the British side, in a way, I think it speaks to their discipline that despite Gage being grossly outnumbered and not getting the forces that he wanted, because the columns were kept in order in their retreat and it was an orderly retreat, it didn't turn into a panicked route. And also they had to wear these heavy wool uniforms in 85 degree weather. And one in five men had been killed or wounded or captured, but they were in danger for hours. When Percy relieved them, it helped them from not being completely wiped out. But it was due to this discipline that they weren't wiped out. As an interesting historical thing I saw about this battle, some historians wonder if the American casualties weren't higher because their record keeping wasn't as thorough as the British was. And sometimes records could be a little bit more speculative and Sometimes you wouldn't even have an officer directing troop movements, so it's hard to know exactly what's going on. Uh, So some have wondered if the assessments of the total fatalities or casualties couldn't have been a bit higher. But the numbers are so small that we're talking about anyway, it hardly matters. I mean, maybe the highest end would be 150 casualties uh, as an assessment. But really, the British, like you said, hadn't expected the militia to attack their column at all. What Militias were thought of weren't even fighting units, but basically social clubs where you would get together and drink and then fire off your musket once in a while. And there's no reason they weren't still that as the war went on. That's what the British thought they were and not good for fighting anywhere. So there you go. Oh, yeah, they're they're still they're still far from being a professional fighting force. By the end of the war, that'll change. But we're going to see Washington is going to const- – George Washington is going to constantly complain about, oh, these militia, they're <laughs> just rubbish, man. Give me some real soldiers. All right. Well, I think that sums up things pretty well. Any other thoughts on Lexington and Concord? No, I think we covered it pretty thoroughly. Uh, it's the beginning of a much bigger – war as i already commented on it and it's it's gonna things are gonna spread and they're gonna get much bigger and much uglier all right well as we like to do in series like these we don't just go through the narrative but also try to give some more context so you understand what's going on uh the next episode we'll do an excursus on british and continental soldiers so you can understand better what exactly was an american soldier going up against how tall would a british soldier be How would he be armed? What would his social background be? How were regiments organized? How was leadership structured? What kind of equipment do they have? Uh, If you could imagine what would be like walking around. So we'll get into all those things and you can help flesh out the war and you can get a picture of it. So we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast. If you'd like more info, go to keybattlesoftherevolutionarywar.com, where you'll find show notes, maps, and other resources that we talk about in these episodes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on the podcast player of your choice. It helps us grow the show and reach new listeners. Until next time, my friends, grab your tankard of ale or glass of Madeira and raise a toast to liberty. Liberty.